Bookworm Games, Episode 2, Your Sanctuary. Welcome, one and all, and welcome back to the world of Earthbound with me, Wesley Schantz. Thanks for listening, and thanks especially to everyone who sent comments and liked and favorited the show and sent words of encouragement. It means a lot. I hope you continue to enjoy. And a special thanks this week to Alexander Schmidt, who's invited me to talk about all sorts of stuff with him, most recently a project called Side Quests, which you can find on YouTube, where we're discussing Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. And Alex also introduced me to Anchor, where he's been creating prodigious lectures on Homer's Iliad, which I highly recommend to anyone interested in myth, psychology, and all things epic. And be warned, you may be inspired to create a podcast or video of your own. Now, as promised this week, we return to the opening sequence of Earthbound, what one might call the overture. In the sudden stillness, after Lardna Minch's smash attack, sucker punch of a slap, as the brave Buzz Buzz, this mysterious hero who has traveled from the dystopian future to call upon you to redirect the course of history through trust and wisdom, courage and friendship, to change the world for the better, well, as a new day is dawning after that late and extraordinary night sometime in 1990X, Buzz Buzz, the revenant, the initiator of adventure, is on the brink of giving up the ghost. When, fortunately, he remembers to give you the soundstone first, and tells you what it is for. Every game has to have its rules. Whether you want to think of social conventions, or dramatic unities, or how to pick who will be it for hide-and-seek tag, and where the boundaries will be set, and whether Ollie Ollie Oxenfree will be the signal to begin a new round if someone hides too well to be found, and what to count up to. No game without rules, no poem without a form, no sense without some set of limits. No transcendence of those limits either. Perhaps no communication would be possible at all. But I'll have to leave that for another day. Anyhow, these 90s role-playing video games are, of course, beholden in their own characteristic rules, conventions, unities, and in most respects, Earthbound is no exception to the expectations of their players. And it's a classic of the genre, um, but with any slightly closer ex- in- ex- inspection, it reveals itself at the same time to be, like any great work, perfectly uncategorizable. Sui generis. As BuzzBuzz Buzz helpfully explains, your goal is to visit the eight Your Sanctuary locations, where the soundstone will record the precious melodies, actually bars of a single melody, which, when it is complete, and when it's integrated with yourself, will open the pathway to defeat Gigas. So, as in most video games like this, and most comic books, fantasy stories, movies, anime, and other cartoons, and, and the kinds of imaginative play that I would get into with my friends when we were running around at recess, or in our backyards, or playing with Legos, or writing our own totally derivative stories on the old WordPerfect program that's saved to an actual floppy disk, and I might have a few of those somewhere. I have to look or I should ask my mom to look at the old house. Uh, in all of these kinds of things, the story is basically the same. Go on an adventure, defeat the bad guy, save the world. It's all too easy to dismiss, isn't it? But again, when you attend to what's going on in Earthbound, even a little, the full force of what's at stake there comes home with absolutely imperative urgency. To go out and find a handful of particular and infinitely significant locations scattered across the whole world, accompanied by not one, but three true friends. And Montaigne points out just how improbable it is to make even one true friend, as we'll have to consider one of these weeks quite soon. To defeat the ultimate manifestation of evil, which is at once the most mysterious and most immediately obvious fact of existence, that there is good and evil and potential in each of us, as Solzhenitsyn maintains, and as anyone from those great authors who endured the Holocaust could attest as well, that line between good and evil runs through the heart of every individual and can, in the right or wrong circumstances, explode in an outbreak of war and suffering, or into unwavering righteousness, or into into banality, or into transcendence. And to save the world, well, to incarnate the promise of a prophecy that's always buzzing at our ear, visiting us in the stillness of the night with a crash 
or soft voice, accompanying and protecting us, whether we understand it or not. As many times as we hear those words, over and over, in every generation, and every iteration, at any moment, it could happen. The world could be saved. You just never know. There's a reason this is the story we like best to repeat, to replay, and to compose songs for and comment upon ad nauseum. It's the story that best tells us who we are, or who we want to be, and what it looks like to become that, and what it costs, and what it means. And what it means is up to us. In short, it is true for us, or not, but we certainly act as if it is, which is just another way of saying that the story continually needs to be retold, just as we continue to tell it, and enjoy it, and interpret it. It is always narrowly overcoming the Starman Jr. sent by Gigas to stifle it before it can begin. And then that Starman Jr. would, with its chrome-plated, narrow, destructive account of the truth, seek to replace it. And this story is always being slapped down by the rictus smile and banal hatred and hatred of the transcendent, represented by Pokey's mom. And it's always being fled from by cowards like po Pokey, who, after all, is the product of such abusive parents. And the wonder of it is tragically being extinguished, even in adventurous kids like Picky, still so innocent. And then it is always being embraced by a determined young soul, like Ness, or whatever you chose to name him. So, a new day dawns, the overture concludes, and the story begins again. We're in the suburbs of a cheerful, bustling, evidently back to normal town. After this rough night, this extraordinary night, the cops have the sharks, the local ruffians, contained around their turf, and at the arcade, their boss Frank is in the back lot, awaiting your challenge. And on the road to the next town, there's a roadblock, of course, because they're going for the world record for roadblocks. And the crank, who lives alone on top of the hill, has something marvelous to show you, he insists. But then, his name is Liar Exaggerate, and he's in advertising. So you can take that with a big grain of salt. And the trumpet player is practicing over by the water on Eagle Point, playing a melody that's found, uh, that's found its way into this game from yet another great work, Dvorak's Symphony from the New World. And that will be, I think, a fitting place to pick up from for next week to look at those three solitary ones, to begin to triangulate on what on Onet, your hometown, is all about. But uh, in the rest of this week's se session, as promised, uh, I want to try to say something about your home, uh, your house, where it all starts, and your family, and your sister, and your mom, and your dad, and your dog, and uh, he's loyal, but not overly zealous, especially when you take him to the spooky hilltop, with the meteorite still smoldering under the starlight. It seems like he knew, just like your mom and dad seem to know, that your adventure has begun. And they both accept this and want to support you in it, and yet know that it's yours to go on. Your dog runs back home, not to venture out again, and your mom sends you off, now proudly and now wryly. Yeah, you're cool, whatever. It's one of her more memorable lines. Your dad gives you practical advice about saving the game and taking breaks from playing, as well as keeping you posted on your experience before gaining a level and the uh, additions to your bank account. But also, he gives you very dad-type words of encouragement about working hard, just like your mother. Indeed, she seems to always be there, ready with a homemade dish of your favorite food to replenish your health fully, and she never lets you leave the house without reminding you to change out of your jammies. Your dad never appears in the game, but he always answers your calls, saves your data and your money, and crucially reminds you it's a game. Your sister, Tracy, for her part, helps you by holding any extra items if your inventory fills up. And that tiny inventory is just one of the logistical elements of the game that can be most vexing until you get used to it. But after all, what a cute yellow backpack that you have on. And it's only very small. Anyway, she's the first character you meet if you explore the hall door before going downstairs at the start of the game. And she sets the tone with her dialogue 
at once informative and spunky. And for the rest of the game, uh, that's, that's also where you find the first item in a present in her room. It's a gift. It's a cracked bat. Again, reinforcing what's different about Earthbound in the midst of following some conventions of weapon equipping and so forth. In all, the family surrounds you and one another with love and support. Each one doing their part, their role, if you like, yet each one revealing flashes of individuality, genuineness, and humor, which are the hallmarks of this game. Without subverting the traditional roles, your mom and dad and sister and dog fulfill and go beyond them, giving an impression of some further story in the background, under the surface. Where is your dad all the time, for one thing? There are numerous theories, and one of my favorite is that he's actually the photographer who drops twirling from the top of the screen to snap pictures of you saying fuzzy pickles, which are then put into a scrapbook at the end credits. And then why does that song that plays in your house, starting when you visit it again after leaving pokies with the soundstone, sound so familiar? The feeling of nostalgia that accompanies the music of Earthbound especially, and uh, particularly in the mem melodies like for your home and the theme of the second town, Tucson, is one of the most immediately striking things about replaying the game or thinking about the effect it has on people. And I wrote an essay on this nostalgia in games, which was published in a short-lived magazine called Et al. Maybe you can find it somewhere online or stuffed in the cushions of an old couch. Maybe. For now, I'll just say that the sentimentality, which can mask the facsimile of a deeper emotion, is one of the things that any commentator, or creative worker for that matter, most needs to guard against. And the other thing, the charybdis to this skilla, would be boredom, triteness, same old story being played out, mailed in, carelessly gestured at, just as sentimentality cheaply imitates the truth without faithfully breathing new life into it, without honestly letting it flex its still vigorous old life, maybe. Anyway, both dangers, sentimentality and boredom, are a kind of false note where the true story, as we say, rings true. And it's a felt thing. It's felt in the little hairs that stick up on the back of your neck pricking in your thumbs. It's in your heart beating faster and your breath quickening and in the tears that threaten to fill the corner of your eyes. And it's real. It's present in many unexpected places, this kind of truth. But like a wrong note in a song, the closer it is to being in tune, the more dissonant it really sounds. So Earthbound, too, can come very close to the irresponsibility of cheap sentiment, like in the theme song which is echoed in your home and in Tucson and end credits, actually. That theme song is carried over from the original Mother, released only in Japan. It's titled Pollyanna, which is a synonym for a trite and unsatisfying cheerfulness. And it's unsatisfying because it's fake, it's hollow, where true love is thick, and true happiness fills and doesn't merely elate or relax. And I recur to these bodily images for my testimony here, uh, not just because the end credits in Earthbound is called Smiles and Tears, and is a reprise of the melody from your home and from Paula's hometown and from your sanctuary melodies recorded by the soundstone. I recur to this bodily image because the truth I'm talking about right now is embodied. I think it's felt as that which corrects the dissonance of Pollyanna sentiment and doll ennui. that the world-saving Your Sanctuary melody and the song running through your home and from many of the town themes, that these are all actually just different versions of the same song, reflects how your family are also individuals in their own right, with their own stories, and how this Saving the World story is at once universal and endearingly particular as it plays out in Mother 2, a.k.a. Earthbound. As in any of these honest, painstaking, and inspired evocations of human art and ingenuity, it reminds us that the much maligned word nostalgia, at its root, means something like homesickness. And it's the indomitable desire to return home 
that carries Odysseus through his wonderful adventures. Maybe it's symbolized by that tree branch which he grabs onto in order to escape Scylla and Charybdis, those terrors of the sea, which he can't defeat. He can only elude. And, uh, and he holds on to that nostalgia, that homesickness or that desire to get home until he's finally back with his wife and son. And in the game Earthbound, uh, homesickness is actually a status ailment, which calling home to your mom uh, is the only cure for. Now, there was one more important topic that I still meant to grab onto to keep from getting carried away here. Um, it's like my tree branch. It's like my mom's sweet voice on the other end of the line. And it's not Homer's Odyssey this time, or James Joyce's Ulysses, for that matter. Though their turn to shed some further light on Earthbound and human nature will surely come. It is, as promised, Marcel Proust's uh, In Search of Lost Time. It's also translated as Remembrance of Things Past, alluding to a sonnet by Shakespeare. Um, and it's especially in connection uh, between Earthbound and the opening of the first book, Swan's Way. And this gets back to the point about truth being embodied. For Proust looks profoundly in two directions, faces in two directions, comparable in this regard perhaps only to Dante. On the one hand, he sums up the richness of Western culture, along with its share of depravities and corruptions, up until that great disintegration, the Great War, World War I. Along with Joyce and Virginia Woolf, then, he, on the other hand, also inaugurates the beautiful new style of memoiristic stream of consciousness, which for all its excesses has contributed in the years since then to an astonishing outpouring of voices hitherto unimagined, let alone allowed to be heard in the purview of great world literature. And with Proust's writing, we see the cumulative experience of, of classic literature, of the Enlightenment, of Romanticism, come to a head, and then this budding and flowering of something new, and something that's to this day still captivating in its forthright honesty, whether we want to call it modernism or postmodernism, or as I've opted to, memoiristic stream of consciousness. This approach to crafting language such that everyday things and experiences are imbued with a depth and beauty and significance. And this process is held in a tremulous balance between conscious awareness and unconscious reveling, between seriousness and play, between dream and waking. If uh, Shakespeare and a Montaigne help to create the individual, then a Dante and a Proust are the great poetic invokers of the whole world of space and time which we experience. Uh, Tolkien, in his way, actually, is another. But for our purposes now, uh, it's the way in which Proust does all this, making up the rules to a new game, if you like, or just playing the same old game with some novel sprezzatura, that's a art history word that's like gracefully making something that's pretty much impossible look easy, you see that in sports, the way like Federer plays tennis or Pele plays soccer. Sprezzatura. The way he does this comes about through an insight that's really just like the one that drives the adventure in Earthbound. And in Earthbound, it's that melody of a connection to the world, a musical representation of the right relationship to things, which accomplishes the saving of the world through wisdom, courage, friendship. And it's the way that the same song that plays in your home turns out to be uh, uh, the same as that song of connection to the world. It plays in the presence of your mom and dad and sister and dog. <clears throat> Only for Proust, the metaphor is not primarily musical, at least not at first, but it's olfactory. It's of taste and, and scent. And it's an impression of a particular taste and smell. His, uh, his sound stone, sound stone is uh, given to him not by any uh, being from the future, but by his dear mom herself, who used to tuck him into bed and kiss him goodnight. And it's given to him in the form of a petite madeleine, like a little cookie or cake or something, and a cup of tea. So here's what happens. I'll read from that Moncrief translation. And suddenly the memory returns. 
The taste was that of the little crumb of Madeline, which on Sunday mornings at Cambrai, because on those mornings I did not go out before church time, when I went to say good day to her in her bedroom, my Aunt Leonie used to give me, dipping it first in her own cup of real or lime-flavored tea, lime-flower tea, sorry. The sight of the little Madeline had recalled nothing to my mind before I tasted it, perhaps because I had so often seen such things in the interval without tasting them on trays and pastry cook's windows, that their image had dissociated itself from those Cambrai days to take its place among others more recent. Perhaps because of those memories so long abandoned and put out of the mind, nothing now survived. Everything was scattered. The forms of things, including that of the little scallop shell of pastry, so richly sensual under its severe religious folds, were either obliterated or had been so long dormant as to have lost the power of expansion which would have allowed them to resume their place in my consciousness. But when, from a long distant past, nothing subsists, after the people are dead, after the things are broken and scattered, still, alone, more fragile but with more vitality, more unsubstantial, more persistent, more faithful, the smell and taste of things remain poised a long time, like souls ready to remind us, waiting and hoping for their moment amid the ruins of all the rest, and bear unfaltering in the tiny and almost impalpable drop of their essence the vast structure of recollection. So, he's been trying to recover that feeling, and it's when he sort of stops trying to that it comes to him. So there's this element of the unconscious being at play here, um, but it's activated you know, by this chance thing, which then he goes on in the rest of this long book to explore quite consciously, um, but with a measure of, uh, of, uh, of chance as well. Um, so I wanted to just try to read that to give you the flavor of it in French as well. Um, and I don't pretend to know French very well, uh, but I just wanted to read it out loud. It's in this student edition that I have here, and the student has helpfully circled some pages and underlined stuff, and uh, of course this is one of the passages that they underlined, so I'll read it. And you can skip this if, if you don't want to listen, but pardon my French. Et tout d'un coup, le souvenir m'est apparu. C'était celui du petit morceau de Madeleine que le dimanche matin à Cambrai, parce que ces jours-là, je ne sautais pas avant l'heure de la messe, quand je l'ai lui dire bonjour dans sa chambre, ma tante Léonie m'a fait, après l'avoir trempé dans son infusion de thé ou de tillou, la vue de la petite Madeleine ne m'avait rien rappelé avant que je n'y scoutais. Peut-être parce que, en ayant souvent aperçu depuis sans en manger sur la tablette du pâtissier, leur image avait quitté ce jour de Cambrai pour se lier à des autres plus récents. Peut-être parce que de ces souvenirs abandonnés si longtemps hors de la mémoire, rien ne survivait. Tout s'était désagrégé. Les formes, et celle aussi du petit coquillage de pâtisserie, si grassement sensuel sous son plissage sévère et dévot, s'était aboli ou insommelé, avait perdu la force d'expansion qui leur eût permis de rejoindre la conscience. Mais, quand d'une passée ancienne rien ne subsiste, après la mort d'être, après la destruction des choses, ce plus frêle, mais plus vivace, plus immatériel, plus persistante, plus fidèle, l'odeur et la saveur restent encore longtemps, comme des âmes, à se rappeler, à tendre, à espérer, sur la ruine de tous les restes, à porter sans fléchir, sur le gouttelette presque impalpable, l'édifice immense du souvenir. So that gives you the flavor of the French, if not any kind of accurate pronunciation. And uh, I just had a little bit more to say about this. Um, 
one difference is that, of course, uh, Proust, or his narrator, if it helps to distinguish them, is an only child, and he seems to be quite lonely, um, though he does have his aunt. All right? Otherwise, the, the parallel is very clear, I think. It's this flood of memories and meaning which comes through the Madeline for Proust, uh, the, the soundstone melodies in Earthbound, and it gets recorded in the recomposition of a whole, as in the form of the book or the game as a whole, including that melody. Um, either way, uh, the flood of memories is triggered by something physical, and it expresses itself primarily in, in physical feelings, right? Um, but also by this, this flood of, of love. And, and I think that love is the greatest mystery of Ness's home and his family. The, the, the source of it, right? Where does it come from? And what is its purpose? How can it, how does it work? It's a great mystery. Um, and its representation in this character who's essentially a cipher, a kind of placeholder for the personality of the player to fill in imaginatively. Ness himself is probably one of the great mysteries of his, of his home um, with that haunting song that plays there. Uh, Ness doesn't speak, but in the sanctuary locations where the melody plays, uh, he recovers these flashes of his past. Um, they come in images and sensations, just like the kind Proust describes there. And so little by little, uh, the childhood that's in the background of this world-saving adventure is filled in. And then, uh, and then at the very end of the game, he does, possibly it's Ness's voice that we're supposed to be hearing, speak in the end credit song. There's the, the English words, I miss you, stuck in, in the song. Um, so, just to recap here. I said a lot of stuff about games and stories in general, proposing here that Earthbound uh, is among those great works, first because it follows a basic plot and some expected ground rules for how to play a game like this, how a story like this goes. You go on an adventure in order to be able to defeat the evil end guy and save the world. And I hinted at a number of other topics to be discussed further, including friendship in Montaigne and some political contexts from the 20th century's great exacerbation of human potential for good and evil in each individual, as examined by the likes of Alexander Solzhenitsyn or Hannah Arendt, and, uh, and all those luminaries, never to be forgotten voices of the Holocaust, such as Viktor Frankl. Um, and I would just digress here a moment, uh, thinking about nostalgia, right, homesickness, you can think of that in terms, too, of the internment camps in the U.S. itself, right? The victims, as well, of the only atom bombs so far used in war, which were, uh, of course, the immediate historical context in which the creators of Earthbound were raised. All right? And uh, to say that these stories, too, are true is simply to highlight uh, social that, that social differences, as well as a universal individuality, which we're so fond of, right, and which makes up together the picture of human nature that we cherish, um, we children of this free and diverse, socially, intellectually, uh, country, this, this context. Um, it is uh, to the representation of our particular homeland, as rendered in the form of Eagle Land in Earthbound, and as reflected perhaps in a more universal fashion still in Dvorak's Symphony for the New World, Symphony from the New World, uh, to which we will return next time. Until then, take care. <laughs>